Welcome back to this Doc Talk, a discussion of screening risk assessment and active surveillance for prostate cancer. So we're going to move on and talk about active surveillance. Dr. Andrew Stevenson, the director of the Center for Urologic Oncology at the Cleveland Clinic, is going to bring us up to date on active surveillance, what it is, what it isn't, and who are the best candidates for it. Andrew? I well, appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all today, Jim, and to share this panel with my two distinguished uh, colleagues, Dr. Klein and Dr. Andrew. So I'm charged with uh, giving you an update on active surveillance for prostate cancer. And I think a nice way to, to, to start off is just discuss, you know, what are the goals uh, for us as physicians who treat this disease? Uh, what are our goals in terms of prostate cancer therapy and, and is really cure uh, the goal that we should be pursuing in all patients, and I would argue not. Uh, really what we should be more nuanced and more sophisticated in what we're trying to achieve for the patient, and I would suggest that we should try to minimize the probability that prostate cancer or its treatments uh, will shorten a man's life expectancy or, or, uh, or impact on his quality of life. And at the same time, we have to be mindful of the costs when selecting the optimal approach. So I've just tried to summarize, this is from the New York Times a few years ago, the two-year cost of prostate cancer therapy, and you can see for a patient who chooses, uh, for example, IMRT or even proton beam therapy, uh, the costs uh, within two years, you can see, are, are substantial. Uh, in comparison, uh, active surveillance, the estimated costs are about $2,500, uh, and so we have to be con uh, conscious of, of the cost differences as well when selecting therapy. So when talking about active surveillance, we also have to talk about what has happened in prostate cancer over the last two to three decades as a consequence of the screening practices that we've embraced uh, in the United States. And so there's a substantial stage migration that has taken place where we're predominantly diagnosing uh, cancers of lower grade and lower stage than we were in the past. And it's somewhat rare now that we're identifying patients who have high grade disease. And why this is important is because, as Dr. Andrew mentioned earlier in his talk, is because of the protracted natural history of prostate cancer, the risk that these low-grade cancers pose to an individual in terms of their life expectancy or their, long, uh, or their quality of life may be very low. Um, uh, Peter Albertson, who is a urologist at Connecticut, uh, published a landmark paper that uh, really set the, the stage for the natural history of uh, clinically detected prostate cancer. These are patients diagnosed in the 1970s who did not receive any uh, curative treatment. You can see that the risks of dying from prostate cancer uh, for a man uh, who has Gleason 6 cancer in, in the top uh, figures uh, is up to 20 to 30 percent within 15 or 20 years of diagnosis. And for those men who have Gleason 7 or Gleason 8 or 9 cancers, the vast majority of them without uh, uh, aggressive therapy uh, will succumb to their disease. The problem is that this may not be applicable to the patients that we're currently diagnosing today, in part because of the uh, stage migration effect of PSA screening. And so Chris Parker, who is a radiation oncologist in London, England, uh, tried to uh, reframe the, the, the uh, Albertson tables uh, in, the, in, in uh, taking into consideration the effects of PSA screening. So a significant difference, if you will, in terms of the risks of death from prostate cancer, at least going out to 15 years. For those men who have Gleason 6 cancers, the risk is, is really negligible. And certainly for those men who have Gleason 7 cancers, it's nowhere near the, the 70 to 80 percent uh, probabilities that were reported uh, earlier. And so this gets back to the, the, the fundamental question about prostate cancer, which was posed by uh, Dr. Whitmore, who, who many consider to be you know, one of the pioneers in urologic oncology. Is cure of prostate cancer possible when it's necessary, and is cure necessary when it's possible? Well, fortunately, we do have data to suggest that the treatment of localized prostate cancer uh, can significantly impact on the natural history of this disease. This was a randomized trial uh, from Scandinavia where men were randomized to a watchful waiting versus radical prostatectomy. This was started before the introduction of PSA, so this is most applicable to men who have clinically detected cancers as opposed to screen detected cancers. And at 18 years of follow-up, uh, the investigators have updated their findings and showed a significant impact of radical prostatectomy on reducing death from prostate cancer, reducing metastasis, as well as uh, improving all-cause uh, mortality. But what this also tells us that is if you can look at the blue uh, uh, bars, is that uh, there's a large uh, proportion of men, due to the protracted natural history of prostate cancer, who will live you know, 15, 18, 20 years 
without ever uh, 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 developing clinical symptoms, without developing metastasis, and certainly uh, not having their life impacted by prostate cancer. There's a smaller percentage of patients who are, will die from their disease despite curative therapy, and the smallest proportion there is those who, who appear to derive a benefit uh, from aggressive treatment. So I've, I've tried to, from the trial data, show you that there's about 20% of men with clinically detected prostate cancer who will benefit from an aggressive treatment approach, meaning that they will avert uh, uh, a death from prostate cancer and avoid uh, developing metastatic disease. Uh, the investigators also um, presented their analysis of men over 65. Remember, these are men who are di diagnosed with clinically detected prostate cancer, and we consider the lead time with screening is somewhere in the order of five to 12 years. This is probably most applicable to men who are in 55 to 60 years of age in the United States. They failed to show any impact of therapy on all-cause mortality or prostate cancer-specific mortality. And in their most recent publication just this month, they did show a very slight reduction in the risk of distant metastasis. Well, we have data um, from this country in a randomized trial. This is the PIVOT trial done in the uh, VA uh, hospital uh, system, where again, of similar design, where men with localized prostate cancer largely in this case diagnosed on the basis of screening were randomized to radical prostatectomy and watchful waiting, and the investigators failed to show any significant impact of therapy on reducing all-cause mortality or death from prostate cancer. The important point to mention about this trial cohort relative to the Scandinavian is if you look at the death from prostate cancer in the watchful waiting arm, it is a fraction of what was reported in the Scandinavian trial in part because of the lead time that we see associated with prostate cancer screening. Uh, reference has been made earlier about the Preventive Services Task Force. So this was the, uh, the government body that uh, suggested that we should no longer be screening for prostate cancer, giving the grade D recommendation. But if you look, if you scrutinize the data that's presented in this document, their main uh, um, uh, concerns about screening not, don't relate to the impact on reducing prostate cancer mortality, but more the harms of overdiagnosis and overtreatment. And that's something that we as a, uh, a treatment community have to uh, address. And why this is important, this is a, uh, we know that all therapies for prostate cancer can significantly impact on quality of life. This was a longitudinal uh, uh, patient reported outcomes of quality of life that was reported a few years ago. These are all men treated at centers of excellence across the United States. We can see that whether they choose prostatectomy, radiation therapy, or brachytherapy, that treatment has a significant impact uh, on their sexual function, bladder function, as well as, as bowel function. Uh, and we know there's good data of active surveillance as it's currently practiced uh, in this country. This is an update from uh, a Dr. Kloss's series uh, from Toronto, Canada, uh, now going out to 10 years. Uh, and he showed that 70% uh, of men in his cohort were free of any treatment at 10 years on an active surveillance protocol. Uh, and of the 97 deaths that were observed now going out to 10 years, only five of the deaths uh, were due to prostate cancer. Uh, reference has also been made about the Epstein criteria. Uh, just to familiarize yourself with uh, what the Epstein criteria is, it, it's clinical uh, uh, parameters based on PSA uh, uh, and the biopsy uh, of, of the prostate cancer. And it's predicting for the likelihood of having indolent prostate cancer, which is defined as a volume of less than 0.5 cc's with no adverse pathologic features, be it Gleason pattern four or the presence of, of uh, extra prostatic uh, disease. Uh, and, and certainly um, these cancers, if they're treated, uh, have a very, very, very low probability of ever developing a PSA recurrence, and some would argue they shouldn't be treated at all. The problem is when you're applying simply the Epstein criteria to select patients for, for active surveillance, in my opinion, now, this is overly uh, restrictive. Certainly men who, who meet the criteria, the Epstein criteria, are good candidates for surveillance, but I think this is really the tip of the iceberg in terms of who we should and shouldn't be offering active surveillance to. The NCCN has certainly addressed this in their guidelines, uh, suggesting um, that uh, certainly men with low-risk prostate cancer are, are reasonable candidates for active surveillance. Um, this is their recommendations for men who have intermediate risk disease, which is somewhat more controversial uh, they suggest that only intermediate risk patients who have less than 10 year life expectancy uh, should be recommended to undergo uh, active surveillance. So I've tried to, to share with you my thoughts of who should and shouldn't be considered uh, for active surveillance. And I would also uh, stay here that the, in, in some cases, watchful waiting would be very appropriate. Uh, the difference between active surveillance and watchful waiting is active surveillance means you're monitoring them uh, rather intensively. 
and you're intervening with curative intent if there's evidence that the cancer appears to be worsening, whereas watchful waiting is really uh, a much less uh, intensive uh, follow-up where you're simply um, administering usually hormone therapy with palliative intent for patients who develop symptomatic progression. So I suggest here that men who have life expectancy of less than 10 years, I think anyone who has non-metastatic prostate cancer certainly can be considered uh, for an observational approach. Uh, those men who have a greater than 20-year life uh, expectancy, I tend to restrict uh, to those who have low-risk features confirmed on a repeat biopsy. And then those who have 10 to 20-year life expectancy, I certainly think it's reasonable to also include those men who have uh, favorable intermediate risk features. The reason why repeat biopsy is so important, this is data from uh, our colleague, Dr. Ryan Berglund, who's here at Cleveland Clinic, showing that the risks of progression on active surveillance with a negative repeat biopsy are certainly very, very favorable. Uh, the reason why the repeat biopsy is important across many series, we see there's about 20 to 30% of patients will be reclassified to a more aggressive uh, uh, form of prostate cancer for which intervention uh, may be uh, considered. Uh, uh, we know that of the patients who are reclassified on active surveillance, the vast majority will be identified at that initial repeat biopsy. So we usually biopsy them within the first three to six months of diagnosis. And of all the men who are reclassified on active surveillance, uh, three quarters of them are identified at that initial repeat biopsy. And then with rare exceptions, patients who are undergoing deferred therapy uh, generally have uh, curable disease, very, very low rates of adverse pathologic features, be it Gleason 8 or 9, uh, lymph node metastasis, or seminal vesicle invasion, suggesting that the selection criteria uh, employed here uh, and the treatment indications that we're using appear to be reasonably uh, safe and effective. Uh, Dr. Andrew mentioned earlier about the need to identify uh, uh, better uh, the aggressive potential of, of prostate cancer by better uh, biopsying techniques. Um, some have advocated doing a 3D transperineal mapping biopsy under anesthesia, where up to 50 or 60 cores are taken uh, from a patient in a uh, template uh, um, approach. Uh, work uh, by some colleagues around the country have suggested this is feasible to do although the complication rates uh, are certainly uh, uh, substantial. Um, and roughly eight to 13% of patients will experience things like retention, hematuria, and uh, uh, hypotension uh, with, these, uh, with this approach. Most importantly, however, this study did show uh, a 20% negative biopsy rate in men who are already diagnosed with prostate cancer, so suggesting that by no means is this uh, perfect in really adequately characterizing cancers. Also, from one of the publications, uh, they did mention that substantial fibrosis was encountered at radical prostatectomy after men had undergone a, a transperineal mapping biopsy, suggesting that uh, you know, there may be some harm in terms of their ability to receive uh, a curative therapy down the road. I think there's an enormous promise with multiparametric MRI. Uh, multiparametric multi MRI involves usually four sequences, sometimes five. Uh, there's a T2-weighted image, diffusion-weighted imaging, dynamic contrast enhancement, as well as with spectroscopy. And I think that with the improved resolution of MRI and with the multiparametric sequencing, I think we're getting much, much better at not only localizing prostate cancer, but also uh, to some degree you know, characterizing its aggressiveness. We can use MRI information to better target uh, the, biops, uh, the, the cancers within uh, the prostate for our biopsy approaches. This is just a, a slide showing you the approach that's used where we're fusing the MR image with the real-time ultrasound image that we're doing in the office at the time of our biopsy. <clears throat> uh, and some preliminary studies using this approach have suggested that we're doing a much, much better job in identifying the areas of the prostate cancer that harbor uh, high-grade disease. A last note about 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. Um, we know from several large prevention studies, which uh, Dr. Andrew was the, uh, the uh, primary investigator on one of them, uh, that 5-alpha uh, reductase inhibitors can have a significant impact on uh, preventing the development of prostate cancer and potentially also uh, modulating uh, uh, existing prostate cancers, mainly those that are low grade. It also is known to improve the performance of PSA. It also improves the performance of our biopsies. So it would appear to be a very attractive uh, uh, therapy uh, for patients who are on active surveillance in part because the toxicity of this medication is certainly uh, very favorable. So we know that 5-alpha uh, reductase inhibitors in the yellow is the low grade cancers uh, the red is the high-grade cancers, the blue is the prostate. So we can see we're shrinking the prostate by roughly 20%. We may also be shrinking uh, the low-grade component so that when we do our biopsies um, uh, on active surveillance, we're more likely to identify uh, the high-grade cancers. 
And because of its effect on PSA, we may also be reducing what we call the PSA-itis or the anxiety that patients experience uh, as a consequence of you know, normal fluctuations in their PSA. So there was a randomized trial that looked at 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. It was called REDEEM. These are men on active surveillance who was a placebo-controlled trial. And we see that men who are randomized to the dutasteride arm at a significantly lower rate of what would be considered pathological progression, which is defined as a Gleason score upgrading or increasing the cancer extent on biopsy. And what was also noted in this trial is that the, the likelihood of needing treatment within three years after a diagnosis with dutasteride was only 7%. So suggesting that there is maybe some value uh, to uh, administering this, this drug to patients uh, who have a low risk prostate cancer and active surveillance. So just in summary, um, my selection criteria for active surveillance obviously is the motivated patient. I recommend that we repeat the biopsy soon after diagnosis uh, to rule out more adverse features. I, I think we're all very uh, excited about the promise that MR and ultrasound fusion has for patients, as well as some of the molecular uh, genetic tests that Dr. Klein mentioned. And again, my selection criteria for active surveillance is if they have more than 20 year life expectancy, I think it's reasonable for any men with low risk features that are confirmed um, subsequent evaluations uh, to be considered for active surveillance, as well as those with intermediate risk features um, who have a 10 to 20 year life expectancy. So I, I appreciate the opportunity to share my thoughts with you today, Jim. Very good, thanks Andrew so much. And, and with active surveillance, how do you recommend that people be monitored on that and, and how often? Well, that's a great question. And, and really the, the ways that we've been monitoring patients have, are, are not evidence-based. Uh, they're largely based on what we've done previously with ad addition of other tests that we think may help us. But in general, patients typically are getting a PSA test uh, uh, a few times a year in my practice. I usually see them every six months. And then I typically, after the repeat biopsy, I will repeat, I'll repeat that biopsy typically every two to three years. I think as we learn more about how these cancers change over time, I anticipate that the need for biopsy likely will go down. The use of molecular markers may help, as well as perhaps MR replacing uh, a routine biopsy in patients. You know, if the MR, for example, shows uh, no identifiable lesion, this patient may be able to forego biopsy at that time. Mm -hmm. Likewise, uh, if the molecular test suggests a very low risk of having adverse features, you may be able to postpone that repeat biopsy for several years. So if, if a biopsy is repeated, you know, every two years or every three years, Eric, do you recommend a repeat of the gene expression profile at the same time? So it's too early to know. It has intellectual appeal that a biologic marker could better monitor whether there is true biologic progression. So for example, the typical situation we see, someone who has one core of Gleason 6 disease on initial biopsy, and on repeat biopsy two or three years later, they have two or three cores of Gleason 6 disease. We don't know if that's true biologic progression or undersampling. Or the occasional patient who goes from three plus three to low volume one core three plus four disease. Is that because it was a different pathologist? Does the pathologist have caffeine that morning and overread it? Yeah. Is that undersampling? We don't know. And that's why I think there's potential value in uh, biologic following patients, but we don't have the data yet to know. So even the genomic profile can show evolutionary progression of the cancer. So we presume that time. that's true, but again, we don't really have any data yet to really know how useful this particular test, any of the particular tests will be. It might, be a, it might be a different level of genomic abnormality that we have to measure. We just don't know that yet. Very good. Still more to learn. All right. Well, thanks very much. We're going to come back to you in just a minute. And Dr. Klein is going to take us through the life cycle of a typical case of uh, a patient who might well be a good candidate for active surveillance.